Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito The Black and Gold Banneret Podcast is brought to you by Orlando Homes Express, brokered by EXP Realty, proudly serving Orange, Seminole, and Lake Counties. Call 407-790-9957 or visit WeSellOrlando.net. Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, and Brian Murphy with you here on this uh, late February evening. It's... uh, we're we're feeling the the very end of basketball season and the spring sports are really getting into full track now. So uh, lots to talk about here on the show. Baseball is underway. Softball is well underway. Basketball is winding down. We got a lot to talk about on this week's show. Blackandgoldbanneret.com. We are SB Nation's home for UCF sports. Uh, you can reach out to us at UCF underscore banneret, facebook.com slash blackandgold banneret as well brian murphy is here brian how's it going i know you're happy about baseball season starting up oh my god you know we talked we, we've talked about manny machado and bryce harper a few times at the end of our shows in recent weeks and, and now I we only have thought, to talk about one of them <laughs> yeah right well we could still talk about machado because that's what we're gonna do right now <laughs> you know we, we uh i thought that maybe oh, it would boy. be a bit of a letdown when he signed because we've been waiting so long for it that if he signed, it'd be like, oh, finally he signed. But given that he got 300 mil still and it went to the Padres, oh, I'm so excited. It's just so awesome to see like a different, a new player has entered the arena and he, he still got his major money. Like it's just so exciting. And we got, we got a live spring training game starting tomorrow with the A's and Mariners. And if you don't think oh, I'm going to. If you think I'm gonna miss that, now I'm no. now I'm really now I'm now I'm ready to just start over. Nice uh, job, Jeff, setting them up on that. Yeah, Whoa. Eric, I'm forbidding. Oh, we weren't that far off. Remember what the bet was? Do you think one of them would sign before first pitch of UCF Siena? It turns out it was first before first pitch of UCF and Stetson. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and actually, I did say that I didn't. That I didn't think either one of them would sign till March, and now I'd be surprised if Harper isn't locked up before March. Uh, so yeah, we'll see. Eric, yes, tune, tune in. Tune in next week to the Black and Gold <laughs> podcast where I talk about Bryce Harper signing with the Phillies. Eric, I hate to break this to you, but uh, Murph took all of your time that I was going to a lot to you to talk about <laughs> oh, the Elimination man. Chamber uh, from Houston uh, a few days ago. But let's uh, let's dive into an actual different type of Elimination Chamber, and that is UCF men's basketball's final six games here. Uh, we're recording this Solid on Wednesday. Segue. Yes, that's. I'm actually really proud of myself about that segue. Um, so last six games here, and it's probably the most brutal six games uh, in the country for any team uh, that we're looking at. Taylor Young is going to join us a little bit later to break things down so far to this point in the season and look ahead to these last six games. But, you know, we talked about how um, in this new net ranking, the quadrant one wins, right? Those are what you got to have. UCF is 0-2 in the quadrant in quadrant one games so far, but four of their final six are quadrant one games. You talk about Houston, Temple, and then now Cincinnati twice, and the first of which is Thursday night, 7 p.m. on ESPN2 at Cincinnati in Fifth Third Arena against Mick Cronin and uh, and Cronin's cronies and all those guys and a Cincinnati team that right now, as we speak is one game ahead of UCF in the loss column in the American standings. Obviously, uh, Houston's number one. They only have one loss the whole year. That was the Temple. But uh, obviously, the magnitude of this game does not, you know, we we don't have to really explain it too much because it's self-evident. But Brian Murphy, coming off of this big win, I thought, probably the biggest win of the conference season so far, at home against Memphis and the way that they did it. 
hitting all the free throws, out rebounding the Tigers when they did. Yes, I know Memphis is all that is not all that strong on the road. I don't care. That's a pretty big win. This is well. I'm not going to ask you the stupid question that I usually do about is this the biggest oh, game of the boy. year? I'm not going to do it. Not going to do it. But is this the most win, No, it's. Game? Not, I'm not doing not that. Gonna do not going to do it. But um, <laughs> would, but yeah, what what, what what is really at stake here? What when you get down to brass tacks? What is really at stake for UCF against the uh, 25th ranked Bearcats? Um, really, what's at stake is really the, the God's honest truth is their first marquee win of the year. Uh, let's be honest; they've had some nice victories against like Alabama, but that's at home, so it doesn't carry as much weight. And Alabama has kind of slipped recently. Uh, UConn on the road is a nice win, but it's it's certainly not Cincinnati on the road. And and these are the kind of games that UCF uh, has to win. I mean, that's what that, that's what this means. This means that UCF gets to pick up some victories that they frankly just don't have right now on their resume and uh the players are aware of this bj taylor talked to him yesterday or two on tuesday and he brought up the fact how big this game is for uh for ucf's resume uh i i think also i think along with that you know and this is a big game obviously i i i just want to say to anybody who wants to use the the must win a narrative no uh i'm not doing it it's not me go ahead (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm just setting myself up here because so it's it's not a it's it's not a must win in the sense there's one there's one thing that UCF can't do within the next week and that's lose to SNU at home uh, that's a can't lose game uh, if if UCF loses to Cincinnati on Thursday I think what what that does more than anything it turns the home game versus Cincinnati on March 7th into a must win now you must win that game against Cincinnati on your home court which would still be a quadrant one win and a pretty solid one at that um, it, it, if you win this game tomorrow or Thursday uh, it, it kind of, I guess you could say for lack of a better term it gives you more breathing room um, even though you don't want to look at it that way but it's not a must win but it would be by far their most impressive and uh, weighty win of the season not even close well, they're standing pat in the net right now at 40. And it seems like they've been kind of hovering around this number for a while. I have to go back and see exactly how long. But uh, they did get leapfrogged just recently by uh, by VCU, who moved up uh, from 42 to 37. Um, and when you look at the team sheet, I mean, it, it's it's just obvious. But, I, you know, now you know me. I like my I like my aggregators. And I go to bracketmatrix.com. And UCF has actually moved up a little bit. Last week they were thinking that they would be a 12, and they were barely hanging on to that last at large slot as a 12. Now they're up in the 11 slot. But are, are so, we okay. all that? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to butt in here and just cut off. I know what you're getting at. Uh, so, uh, two things uh, when you look at these sort of things. One, don't concern yourself so much at this point because we still have about three weeks of the conference play across the sport. Don't concern yourself so much with like what are teams on the bubble also doing that could help UCF or not help not hurt like it hurts UCF or help UCF. Like Florida beats LSU tonight in LSU. Uh, oh, that hurts UCF because Florida is right there on the bubble with UCF. So probably maybe maybe they maybe they bump over UCF in somebody's rankings. There's so many. There's still there's still so much to be played. Don't pay attention to any bubble talk until the conference tournament week. Before then, well, that's no fun. Come on, yeah, don't take that away from me. Come on, man. It's there's there's too ma- there's there's too many. I know you all are having so much fun with this. There's too many variables to track to make that a, 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 a substantive discussion. Secondly, if you look at UCF and say like, well, this team has this this guy has them in as, as like one of the first fo- one of the first, last four in, and and they're on, they're going to Dayton or they're one of the last five in are great. Even in the conference tournament week, if they're like one of the last four in in most of the brackets, you I can't say this enough. That is an uh, is an awful position to be in <laughs> because it forces you it, it, it forces you to win. Knowing that at least three to four bids will be stolen across the sport, it happens every year. About an average of three point six bids are stolen uh, in conference tournaments every year. So if you're one of the last four in during conference tournament week, you're probably not getting in the tournament because your spot is going to be taken by someone who is not being considered for the bracket. 
but is going to win their bid through the conference tournament. So again, UCF is so far away from any discussion I'd like to have about their bubble or their bracket sitting. Like it, there's too many, there's too many games left, and there's too many teams out there, especially once they get to the conference tournament, that can make it all meaningless. Eric, that's no fun. Can you please justify my <laughs> desire to? <laughs> Did yeah, Mike, remember, justify my desire to mash the panic button. Out of, we have con- me and Jeff Scott, we got content coming out about the bubble. Out of so I just, I yeah. just bashed our yeah. own content. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, you, for, thanks, for, um, thanks for undercutting my, my, my things that I was going to write anyway. Go ahead. Whatever. <laughs> here, here, here's where I will meet Merv halfway on all that. I don't think this Cincinnati game is as big as we think. I actually think Murph made a point in a weird way. The SMU home game is bigger because I agree with Murph. That is, you cannot lose that game because what's going on with teams that are, quote, on the bubble right now, and we saw this Tuesday night, teams are losing games left and right. Alabama lost to A&M, which is a terrible loss for them. Indiana lost at Purdue. They're now a 500 team. They're a mess. Uh, other bubble teams in Arkansas lost recently. I mean, bubble teams are there for a reason because they're losing games, and they're losing games that they shouldn't be losing to. And I think the thing that people we're, we're so focused on the marquee wins and what UCF doesn't have, I kind of compare UCF right now to a golfer. That golfer that's going to take the layup on a par five. He's just not going to go for the green and two like others are. They're going to go for the par. And what you want to make sure is you get at least a par here and don't bogey the hole. And I think that's where UCF is right now. Obviously, if you beat Cincinnati, it's a huge signature win. But they have other opportunities for that. They have a home game against Cincinnati. They have a road game against Houston. I actually think the Temple game on the road is a huge game because that is a potential team that you're going head-to-head with from a bubble standpoint, not to mention you have opportunities in the conference tournament. So I actually think the SMU game, in a weird way, is a bigger game because let's say they did beat Cincinnati, but then you lose to SMU at home. You almost cancel that out anyway. And right. a bad loss, I think, punishes you more. It keeps you out of the tournament uh, more than actually winning games. It's weird as it sounds, but that's why teams are in the bubble. And you know this, Jeff, as a Syracuse guy. Syracuse in the past has been knocked out of uh, the NCAA tournament because usually they have a bad loss or two that uh, knocked them out of the tournament late in the year, lost early in the conference tournament. So there's a lot of variations. A bad loss is almost worse than having a quality win because they can negate, they can knock you out based on that. So. Uh, I actually agree with Murph. I think the SMU game in a weird way is bigger because you cannot avoid to lose th- uh, that game. Where Cincinnati is obviously a, would be a great from a signature standpoint, but if you lose that game, it's not the end of the world because you still have other at-bats with uh, uh, birdie opportunities if you go with the golf theory hmm. with Cincinnati at home later in the year. Temple's a big game. And then, of course, Houston. Well, Possibly, I, US, possibly USF, too, if right. they win a couple of games. Yeah, that's the game I was going to bring up that's, that's starting to look real because that's a road game at the – I was going to say the Sun Dome, the Yingling Center. Stupid. Well, they're also but, at, they're also at Houston at Temple. Right, right, right. But I, but I feel like yeah. you can, you know, you can you can argue, you know, well, we're supposed to if you lose those games, well, you're supposed to lose the the game at Houston because they're. I mean, they might be they might be a two seed. Um, the Cincinnati game at home is really kind of interesting, but that game at South Florida and like you guys mentioned the game at home against SMU in particular I think that those are the ones that you got to have on the you got you got to knock those out and that's where the most pressure is going to be um yeah. and plus we know that we know that South Florida is going to want going to want to win that game real bad for obvious reasons that that we won't have to go into here but um but yeah this is yeah it, it's like we said before we are going to find out in a hurry uh, what kind of team this is, and hopefully that you know we'll be able to see you know them peaking at the right time. I, you know, I, I don't know if we've seen this team play its best basketball yet. I don't think so personally, but, um, but again, uh, I mean, I thought the USF game was pretty good. I mean, I thought that was the best defensive effort they've had all year defensively. Yeah. They looked like the team two years ago, and they had good streaks there with Memphis. Give Memphis credit; they made some great yeah, that, runs. That there. second, that second half against Memphis, I thought was probably the most impressive stretch of basketball I think I've seen them play. In terms of one half, that was probably yeah. the most impressive half I've seen of the year. But um, here's a question. Here's a question for both of you because I know we're going to get into this on the women's side because it's very fascinating. Would you rather be the men's team that has this tough schedule down the stretch, but have opportunities with Cincinnati, Houston, Temple, even you know, to improve your resume, but at the risk of losing those games, or would you rather be the women's team that's kind of in position to make the tournament but has no quality games left? 
They're all winnable games. You can win those. But if you lose one of those games, it could potentially just crush you from a tournament standpoint. Which Who would you rather be? No, you'd much rather be UCF. You'd much rather have a chance to Which win one? the hard – no, sorry, you're you're comparing UCF game. <laughs> uh, the men's the men's team. You you'd want to have the opportunity to to not leave a doubt that you should be in by beating quality teams, and you know with some recency bias as well late in the year. Yeah, I agree because you're going to make your case in these last six games no matter what. I think if they if they screw this up the last, you know down the stretch, well we can look back on it and say you know what this team wasn't as good as we thought. Uh, and and it bore itself out. It it's when you're kind of in that that you know we could win, but we just don't know. That's the part where the more uncertainty that there is, the 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 worse I th- the worse off I think it could be. So fantastic transition, Eric Lopez. By the way, the men's team does play Cincinnati again. As a reminder, uh, uh, at Cincinnati uh, on Thursday, 7 p.m. ESPN two. That game next home game Sunday. Uh, and that game is on CBS Sports Network Sunday noon against At SMU. Noon. Yep, early oh, early God, tip, no. early tip, baby. And uh, also, uh, don't forget to stay tuned to this podcast a little bit later. Taylor Young is going to join us to talk about uh, his his insight and perspective on UCF basketball right now. But speaking of teams that play good teams down the stretch, UCF women's basketball just did that, and uh, they played on Sunday. At home against UConn, and uh, well, UConn is UConn, right? Uh, buddy of ours, Eric Lopez, used to always say Duke is Duke. Um, UConn is UConn. Uh, Seventy-eight forty-one was the final. Um, all right, now let's uh, let's go here for a minute, okay? Because it, it, it's easy for everybody to kind of look at UConn and be like, you know, man, like, like, like what are we even doing in the same? What is any team even doing in the same gym as them? But I wrote up on blackandgoldbanneret.com a couple, one thing the other day. I was courtside for that game. Uh, I had a front row seat to... Oh, oh like, you hear that, Murph? Courtside. Front row. Well, I do PA for the I do PA for the, for the game, so Whoa, of course I'm courtside. Jack, you sure Jack Nicholson wasn't sitting next to you? I'm positive, unless Jack Nicholson's name was Dean Smith. Anyway, um... <laughs> What? Let's Carolina talk. Head coach, for the record, not the North Carolina. Not head the North coach. Carolina head coach. Our buddy Dean Smith, who, who, oh run, who is, uh, who's, who's one of the who's on the uh, uh, the official scorer staff. But all right, I decided him himself. I, he is a legend. Um, I decided to write up the title of the article is "Let's Talk About the Good Things from UCF Women's Basketball's Game Against UConn," and <laughs> um, and actually, you know, going back and looking at it, there were a couple of good things. All right, Katie Lou Samuelson. National Player of the Year candidate, uh, UConn's leading scorer. UCF held her scoreless from the field. She was 0 for 5 from the field. Perfect 12 for 12 at the line. More on that in a second. UCF did hold UConn under 50% shooting, two percentage points under their season average of 49.4. Now, uh, UCF did hold them under 40% in the first half, but in the second half, UConn turned it on. And if UCF was going to have any hope, they would have had to have hold them under 40% as a team since when you hold UConn under 40% this year, they're 1-2. and two. Uh, The foul shot advantage was 20-4 to four in favor of UConn. Um, not saying there's anything untoward about that, but I'm sure that will raise some eyebrows. Um, the Knights forced UConn into 21 turnovers. That's a season high for them. Uh, the Huskies force UCF into 23 turnovers of their own. So you can't do that. You can't you can't hand it back to them like they did. Um, and the, the loss did drop UCF in the RPI, but only three spots because, like I said, it's UConn. And UCF got some help from Temple beating Cincinnati. So right now, UCF is still alone in second place in the American. And they got four games to go, and they should wrap up the number two seed uh, in the conference tournament and be on the opposite side of the bracket if they take care of business. Um, I know you guys were were away, or, were, or rather, Murph, you were at baseball watching the game, but Eric, you were watching the game on TV. This felt like UConn had a real mission to to kind of show UCF that, look, we're the top dog around here, and, and they took care of business. But am I being a little bit too Pollyanna-ish by looking at some of those things that UCF did well in that game? 
Well, first of all, we got to stop talking about Samuelson because, in my opinion, she's not even the best player on our team. Collier is the, be- is the better player. I, I, player of the year. Yeah, I, I, so, I, I have to agree with you that I, I thought that Nafisa Collier was the best player on the floor. I, I really, yeah. I, I really did. Now, now, nothing against Katie Lou because she's freaking amazing in her own right, right? Like, what team wouldn't want to have a six three guard who can shoot like she can? Correct. But, correct. But Nafisa Collier was the leading scorer in that game, and she was the best player on the floor. I thought. I found it interesting, and Gino Rama talked about it afterwards about UCF being, uh, you know, it was a chippy game, being physical. Uh, I think Gino liked that. I think he liked the fact that his players were pushed around and how would they respond, and things like that. And boy, they responded in the third quarter. He didn't sound um, like he liked it <laughs> during the game. Yeah, right? He was pretty upset. <laughs> um, this is the this is the concern I have, and you're not going to be UConn. I I get all that. I was kind of hoping, Jeff, from a resume standpoint, they would have played a game like last year where they kept it with, you know, and it sounds weird, but this is women's basketball we're dealing with when you talk about UConn. You know, last year UCF played them a low-scoring game, and it was about, what was it, like a 55-37 game. That was actually a pretty good result. I remember we had Charlie Cream on, uh, who's the Murph's favorite, the bracketologist in women's basketball. Uh, <laughs> and he said that that actually was one of the reasons why UCF was in the mix for the field last year, because that actually was a quality – uh, performance. It was a quality yeah. loss? Yes. Yes, we've heard those, right? <laughs> um, so the fact that this game got out of hand was not good because actually Charlie Cream in his latest bracketology uh, has UCF as one of the last four teams in. Like they're, They dropped that far to one of the last four teams in and one of the issues they have is because the conference is down this year, especially South Florida with all the injuries they have, mm-hmm. outside of UConn, if you pull off the miracle against UConn, there are no quality wins in the league right now. And that's the the issue UCF had. They won uh, Wednesday night against Wichita State on the road in a game they pulled away late. That was critical because Wichita State had an RPI of 249 going into the game. You lose that game, that would have been catastrophic, Uh, Murph. I would have actually grabbed Jeff's emergency panic button and used it myself <laughs> if they would have lost to Wichita State. That's how bad that loss would have been. And you look at the remaining schedule. Tulane, 150 RPI. Not great. Temple in the 140, something like that. Add Houston's not terrible. Houston's in the 90s RPI. But the, Jeff, you could look at the resume. Their best win, I think, is Villanova at home in November. And that's the thing I'm nervous about for this team is you know they they don't have as much room to 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 mistake here because if they get another ba- a bad loss, which you know you could say, well these teams are better than the RPI shows, and that's true. But mathematically, unfortunately, when teams look at the resume, they look at a temp a Tulane loss and they don't look at it as well. That's not they're they're not bad. No, it's a bad loss because they're 146 RPI. They got to win out here in the regular season and probably to be safe, get to the final uh, of the tournament because if you lose a game like that to a team like Tulane again or to Temple, now you could be sweating it out come Selection Monday because let's be honest, we know where the automatic bid's going to go to. So, um, you know, that's to me the critical part here moving forward. And I think it was a good sign that they responded with the Wichita win in the second half after the UConn uh, game. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, I just – it would be really hard for me to imagine a situation where if UCF – did win out that they would keep them out of the tournament regardless of I mean if you suffer a really embarrassing loss in the tournament then yeah I mean I think you could probably look at that and wonder oh, what's what going to happen right, but right, yeah you're right but you know I, I, looking at the standings as they are right now okay Temple Tulane Senior Day is going to be Saturday March 2nd and you, uh, the good thing is they got a week to prepare for that game and T- Tulane was the one team that beat them that um, it's probably the the worst conference loss that UCF has suffered to this. Well, it's the only team that they lost to that wasn't called UConn. But um, they're twenty one and five right now overall, and ten and three in the league. So you're looking at a team that if they win these last three, you're looking at. Uh, and actually, I, I should correct myself actually because I think I don't, I don't think they've updated the standings. Is that true? I'll do, I'll double check here, but. Um, yeah. Not, okay. Yeah, they did update the standings, so they're twenty-one and five, ten and th- ten and three. And you're looking at, let's see, win, 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 twenty-four and five, thirteen and three in the league, and you're gonna hold them out of the conference tournament. I mean, well, no, I, think, I get, I, I, I get that the league is not as strong as it used to be. I get that, but 
to me, that's it's you know we're not talking about the Ohio Valley Conference here. I mean, this is you know this is still a good this is still a good enough team to be in that field. Am I nuts? No, here's the thing. I'm, look, if they win, I'm just saying, if they win out, I agree with that. I think they'll be in. I'm just saying, don't lose one of those games. Do well, not yeah, lose yeah. to Tim at home. Do not lose to Tulane at home. Don't give you – here's the problem, because here's the thing. Their best wins, if you go based on the RPI, is Villanova back on November 25th at home. Their RPI is 45, Villanova. Their second best win, if you go based on RPI, Quinnipiac on the road, 66. That's their second best win. Cincinnati's their third best win at 88 every other win they've had to this point and then houston 97 those are their four top 100 wins they have to this point that's not going to blow away the resume the, the, the committee i'm just telling you now again i think if they win out in the regular season and, and, and then get to the final of the tournament i think they're in my concern is if you lose to temple or you lose to tulane or if you get upset in the opening round of the conference tournament jeff i think you're gonna have to sweat it out I don't know. Just wait till they just wait till they move the net over to the to the women's game too. And then what are we gonna do? I have no idea. But um, <laughs> one thing we do have to bear in mind, obviously, you know, it, yes, the win over Wichita State tonight. By the way, fifty-seven forty. I should note it. I should note that Wichita did not score in the fourth quarter until there was two seventeen left. Did not score a point in the fourth quarter until uh, seven minutes and forty-three seconds in. And uh, UCF gets the um, eight-point victory. KK Wright had 21 on 9 of 19. And she had a pretty good game against UConn, too. She was UCF's leading scorer with 18 points. But, um, you know, you hold Wichita State to 37%, and uh, that's what you should get. So we'll have to see, um, you know, again, holding serve as they should. Eric, you're absolutely right about do. that. Just do. keep holding hold serve, and they'll, be, and they'll be all right. We will hold court when we return from this break. With Taylor Young, the analyst of UCF men's basketball uh, on the UCF uh, Athletics Radio Network, he sits alongside Mark uh, Daniels for all the home games. He will talk to us about uh, you know how the conference looks at least at this point, whether or not he thinks UCF men's basketball has played its best game yet, and you know just what it's like grinding this last uh, uh, few games before as as we barrel on toward the month of March here in college basketball. Stick around, we'll have that and more when we return. This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Back after this. The Black and Gold Banneret Podcast is brought to you by Orlando Homes Express, brokered by EXP Realty. Sam Unger and his team at Orlando Homes Express proudly serve Orange, Seminole, and Lake Counties, specializing in buying, selling, and new construction. Sam is a very proud UCF graduate, class of 2006, and he's got a special deal going on right now for the 2018 UCF football season. Night fans, in honor of UCF's 25-game win streak, Sam is running a special for the whole month of December. If you use him as your realtor to buy or sell your home, you'll receive up to $2,500 at closing. So, if you're ready to buy a new home or sell your current home, upgrade or downsize, Sam and his team have you covered so you can find the right home at the right price in the right location. So give them a call right now at 407-790-9957. Again, that's 407-790-9957. Or visit them on the web at WeSellOrlando.net. Again, that's WeSellOrlando.net. You can also reach them on Facebook at Facebook.com slash WeSellOrlando. Get in touch with the Orlando Homes Express today and make finding your dream home a reality. Eric Lopez here, and when you're not listening to me on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast yelling at Jeff Sharon or talking baseball with Brian Murphy, you can actually listen to me on another podcast with a fellow UCF alum, a lot smarter, Victor Anderson and I, as we host In the Circle on Fast Pitch News twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. We cover all the world of softball, so if you're UCFA, we talk UCF, we talk how Coach Gillespie's going to do at Iowa, we talk the all the topics in college softball, pro softball, and international softball. So give us a follow on In the Circle SB on Twitter and on Facebook. It's In the Circle on Fast Pitch News twice a week on the podcast. Check us out there. Back now to the Black and Gold Banneret. All right. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez with you here. Blackandgoldbanneret.com, UCF underscore banneret on Twitter, Facebook.com slash 
black and gold banneret. And joining us now, our special guest, multi-time returning guest. I mean, I, I, I'm working on the swag that I got to get you here, uh, Taylor. Taylor Young joins us. He's the uh, radio analyst for UCF uh, men's basketball on uh, the uh, UCF Sports Radio Network, 96.9 The Game, alongside Mark Daniels, also UCFnights.tv. How you doing, T.Y.? How's it going so far? I'm good, man. I'm, I'm just glad to be back. You know, <laughs> this, this is always fun to hang out with you guys over, over the radio waves. And, uh, yeah, it's an exciting time, man, coming in into February, early March Madness coming coming soon. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving life right now. Yeah, well, I mean, hey, here we are. All of a sudden, it's like the last time we talked to you, it was, you know, before conference play started. And now, you know, we're coming down the stretch. Last uh, last few games before the uh, conference uh, tournament. And th- there was a – how would you evaluate conference play at least so far overall? You know, the, obviously there were a few slip-ups. There was, uh, you know, some losses to, to some teams that I think you'd probably expect. You know, I mean, the loss to Houston. I mean, Houston's so good right now. I mean, they're – they're on the outside looking in, but but at least a competitor for maybe a one seed. You know, you had the we had the loss in Memphis, but then you know the lo- wins in the last three against at SMU, against South Florida, and then against Memphis uh, at home. And I thought that this last Memphis game was probably the best overall game we played all year, at least in conference. So especially in these last three, but it, but especially after this Memphis game, as they get right ahead into Cincinnati, how do you evaluate the team at least as of right now? as we head into the final half month before March? I think they're doing a fantastic job. I mean, I think they've had some really big victories. Um, I think they've had a few games that, that they like to have back. But I think more than anything else, what they've done, um, for the most part, is protect home court. And in a conference season, that that's such a big deal. I mean, it really is a formula. We talked about this before, but you've been trying to win a conference championship the 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 formula to put yourself in the uh you know the conversation is to you know win at home and then split on the road when you can um and so you look at those those road losses uh memphis and then and then wichita state um you know wichita state's a team you can't figure out it seems like they're talented but they've had a down year lost a lot of guys but a really 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 tough venue to play in at a 10 p.m. Eastern tip time. So God, that was weird. Kind of an odd, <laughs> yeah, just like an odd travel and, and, and an odd game that they still had a chance at the end, it seemed. And, um, you know, and, and, then, and then a really big win to start conference season. A Temple team that's now putting together a run, um, for, putting together a resume for, for their own March uh, bubble conversation. So, but you mentioned it. Houston really has been the class, followed by Cincinnati. And so that Houston game at home, Houston really controlled the tempo, and and UCF would like to have another shot at them, which they will. But I mean, again, I think they're doing a really, really good job of taking care of business when when needed. You know, that that game against Memphis, the last time out. I mean, uh, you don't want to say it's a must win, but that's that's somewhat of a must win if you're talking at lab, uh, a large bid. And and a game like that where you just you can't afford to drop, and they came out to care of business. So I think you're pleased that they've been very business like lately, and I think really building and not playing their best basketball yet. I think that really their best basketball is in front of them, and I think they're training in the right direction, and I think that's saying a lot given the resume they've put together so far, and, and I think the exceptional season they've had. Taylor, the, as we get down to the stretch here of these games, it looked to me like Taco Fall and BJ, the seniors in particular, have raised their game to a different level. I think Taco has played tremendous at a high level the last few games. I mean, as a player, as you get down the stretch in the season, do you kind of sense that, that maybe sometimes, especially maybe a senior, knowing this could be their last run here, they raise their game here down the stretch because these games get bigger and bigger as we go down the stretch here with possibly with all the makings of trying to make the NCAA tournament and conference championships at stake? You, you certainly think so, right, Eric? I mean, the word that comes to mind for, for those seniors and the guys that have been around uh, is perspective, right? You, you're having a perspective that you're coming towards the end of your career. You're also having a perspective that you know how hard it is, you know, because over the years, four years, I mean, gosh, BJ's in his fifth year, and, um, you know, you, you see the, 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 the adversity and the shortfalls and that it's, there's no guarantee that you're going to have a chance at um, NCAA tournament play or postseason play every year. So I think as you get older, you gain a perspective 
that each game and each possession is more valuable than maybe you thought it was when you were a freshman or sophomore and your whole career was in front of you. So I think the best teams, when you look at historically, um, have their best players or most talented players bought in, leading, and playing well. And that's what I see with this UCF team, as you mentioned. You know, Taylor, these last, you know, five games, like you said, as we come down the stretch, it's like you, you like you were sensing, like you were saying, you know, you kind of start sensing, especially the seniors, that your basketball mortality a little bit. Yeah. And these last five games, man, are really tough, especially the two against Cincinnati right now. And, it, you know, obviously Houston's also on that. You know, they're going to be at Houston on March the 2nd before finishing up uh, uh, at uh, at home against Cincinnati and then at Temple, but but with these two games against Cincy, man, I, I'm just interested to know how when you played, how you approached this grind right now because you know we're in mid February, you're feeling tired, everybody's hurt, and now you got to go play this team that their calling card is just beating the living tar out of people. How, <laughs> how, how do you, how do you get, how do you get yourself mentally prepared as a player for those kinds of games in late February? Yeah, it's a really good description of, of conference season. Jeff is like mid February. It's like both your ankles hurt. You got a low back tweet, you know, every, yeah. everyone has something going on. No one is typically going to be 100%. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the normal that, that you come to expect at this point in the season. But, you know, I think it, it, it comes down to just being a competitor and, and, and realizing, you know, yes, is it going to be a challenge, but that's also a great opportunity to, to go on the road. You know, we used to use the language, you know, go get a road kill, right? So it's just a mindset. When you go on the road, it's, it's you against the world. You know, it's, it's a group of guys. It's a group of coaches that come together and it's you against the world in that uh, arena. And, you know, sometimes the taller the task, um, you know, more of a requirement to come together and, and really unite and, and, and just compete your tails off. And I think that's what you do. I think you make the game smaller. You, you look at going to get a, a win at Cincinnati at this point, you know, you start looking down the road of, okay, if we get this win or if we get this loss, what do we have left? But, no, in reality, I think the, the really veteran teams will, will find a way to lock in on that first possession or that first defensive stop or what they're doing offensively and, and recognizing uh, personnel and, and sets and just making the game smaller um, and, and just letting the compound effect happen over the game. And if you play well enough on the road, you give yourself a chance at the end to, to steal one and, and, and go get a victory. You know, I think that's what you look to do. And, and, you, know, you talk about getting those guys ready. I mean, Coach Dawkins, if you watch him on the sidelines, or you know anything about his playing career, and that guy is a hell of a competitor. So those guys follow that suit. And you can, you can guarantee with the stakes as high as they are that, that he'll have them ready to compete. Taylor, what's been your thoughts on Houston, who you saw up close in person, and what a year they're having under Kelvin Sampson uh, with only the, you know, the one lost in Temple? And then Cincinnati, who UCF obviously plays, McCronin, some people thought maybe they have a drop off after last year, winning the, the conference regular season and tournament title, losing the some of the veterans they did. But you got guys like Cumberland who's kind of stepped up, might be the front runner for Player of the Year. What's your thoughts on Houston and Cincinnati? Uh, kind of seeing them from afar and up close. You know, they're just really good programs and really, really good coaching staff. Um, you know, those head guys are doing incredible jobs. Kelvin Sampson. Um, a guy should probably be up for, for coach of the year, given what he's done with, with, with Houston. Um, but what's really cool about what you mentioned is, you know, you have Houston who lost Rob Gray, their leading scorer and playmaker last year. And you have Cincinnati over the last few years, lose, lose players like Troy Payne and, and, and different guys, uh, Jacob Evans, you know, different guys that were their lead guys. And now they're still elite among the conference. And so I think when you see that, it kind of goes to show, you know, how they're developing their younger players, uh, you know, how they're getting their guys to buy in and play hard and just building programs in the American that, you know, year after year have a chance to compete for championships. So um, they've been kind of the class of the conference over the last couple of years with Wichita State uh, being a new member um, that added a lot of value. And I think if you're UCF, you're, you're trending towards that. And that's, that's the fun part about college basketball is you got – a lot of new guys each year. You have guys graduate each year, and you kind of 
refill and replace and, and hope to build upon a program. Taylor Young joining us here on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. All right. I, I, th- this uh, this net ranking thing that we're looking at all the time, which just <laughs> it, it's starting to drive me crazy because you, you know just when it felt like we were starting to figure out RPI a little bit, they throw the wrench into right. it. Do, what are your thoughts on on this new ranking system in, in terms of you know where is it rewarding teams like UCF properly in your opinion? I have no idea what it is. Yet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, it, it is it is funny, and, and as fans, like you get the sense that we're never going to be happy regardless. Um, but it's always worth a conversation, whether it be college football um, or, or college basketball. Um, so I don't know, but I, I know teams like UCF. Here, here's what I will say. You know, because because certainly you can get in the quadrant one wins and two mm-hmm. wins and all that stuff, and 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 some of that stuff you get into the weeds a little bit but one thing about college basketball that i think is worthy of talking about that's changed since i played especially um but just continues to get like this is the the exposure that teams like ucf get yeah um you know going to the american from conference usa is, is is was a big jump but even more so i mean every game is on espn streaming every game i mean the cincinnati game i think it's espn too so you're starting from a national recognition standpoint in college basketball. You can watch hoops Monday through Sunday and see a team like UCF and get your eyes on it. So from a fan's perspective, so there's just a lot of opportunity and exposure for teams like UCF lately with the TV exposure. Um, you know, the net ranking versus the RPI. I know, you know, the big, the big, um, you know, factor is, 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 is road wins uh, as always, especially in the RPI. Um, and so that kind of, it kind of remains true, but, um, you know, it's, it'll be interesting after a, a couple of years and, and the experts debate it, whether whether it's good thing, bad thing, or or uh, what we do moving forward. Yeah, well, I mean, do players these, pay uh, attention to that? Do players pay attention to that, or do they block that off? I know coaches probably take and keep an eye on that for obvious reasons. Uh, and certainly, you know, I'm sure media relations people help them with that and things like that. But I'm curious, do players pay attention to the RPIs back when you played and now this net deal, or do they just block that off completely? Are they even aware? That's, that's a good question. I mean, everyone's different, right? But I will give you my perspective. I would say for the most part, again, I think as you're a younger player, you, you just don't realize what's at stake. You know, I mean, like, for it's coaches' jobs, right? I mean, you got people's jobs on the line, their families on the line. And, and for me, most of my career, you know, following the RPI and stuff like that, I, I just wasn't really as tuned into that. You know, I, I was – I was a college kid going to class, hoping to get some, you know, get some playing time and compete. And you got so much going on. And so um, that stuff, it just, I never got into um, until maybe the very end of the season. Um, But, you know, I I would imagine that UCF specifically that, you know, now that they've put themselves in a position where, you know, they, they can make a run for an at large bid that, that they know what's at stake. Each of these games, they know what's at stake. And, and I'm sure the coaching staff has relayed that message in a way that, um, you know, not to scare them, but give them the excitement and the opportunity that, that lies in front of them. Because if you fast forward um, or, or you, you rewind a little bit, you know, you go back to the A-Sun Conference USA days, like you really didn't even have the schedule that if you had a successful year that you, you would be in the conversation with an at-large bid unless you just – you had very, very low numbers in the loss column. So what I think is unique about UCF and why they're probably paying a lot more attention these days to that is they have a legitimate argument uh, at an at-large bid, and they have a legitimate opportunity in the next couple games to really, really get that recognition to secure that bid. So um, that that would be my perspective, Eric. Well, you're talking yeah, – no, and I, I think it's important too, real quick, because Temple's in the same boat. They're trying to make the tournament. I've seen a lot of projections that maybe a four-bid league, and yeah. that's the big difference, Taylor, than it was when you played at Conference USA, when it was maybe a one, maybe two-bid league we're fighting for. But this year at the American, last year a three-bid league, this year probably three- to four-bid league, and that's the great competition. And we're not even talking about teams like Memphis, who I think could be a real threat come the conference tournament, as you know as well as anybody. They're a completely different right. team playing in that arena with the talent that you just saw up close with Penny Hardaway coaching them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they play fast, you know, so if they can make shots, they're tough. They're tough, and if they can turn you over, they're tough. Um, 
Yeah, it, it is interesting too. And then you, you just, again, it goes back to the perspective. Um, in the early days of my career, you have Memphis, who was, you know, a top 10, top five program who went undefeated in the league, it seemed like every year, right? So they were the at large bid, but they were also winning the conference tournament because they were just so much better than everyone else. So, I mean, really, your only shot really to get a bid was to knock off Memphis in the conference championship which was a very, very tall task. So I think we've come a long way, and I think the balance of the conference has given UCF a tremendous opportunity. Um, from a recruiting perspective, uh, I believe it would help. Um, I think the more bids this league gets, that helps recruiting. Um, so, so, yeah, four bids would be amazing for the American. Um, I tend to think it would be uh, a three-bid league, but it just all depends on what happens in these last couple games and, and how it shakes out. Well, it's a couple of big UCF uh, opportunities for UCF coming up. But these last six games, Taylor, four of them, at least as of right now, and I'm looking at the team sheet on uh, NCAA.org right now, four of them are Quadrant 1 games. There's the one game away at Houston, both Cincinnati games, and then the game at Temple because uh, they're, they're a top – because uh, they're, they're, they're at least at 52 right now in the net. So mm-hmm. that's – so. With these last six games, I mean, yeah, we are going to find out what kind of team we have right now. But I want to talk real quick specifically about this game at Cincinnati. If you're a UCF fan, we're going to be watching this game on ESPN2 Thursday night. What are you watching for, at least in the early going, that is going to be a determining factor for UCF in this ball game on the road at the Bearcats? Yeah, yeah, it's... It, it... It's a big one, and if you're listening to this podcast, I would, I would hope you'd tune in. Um, it's, it's it's a huge game, but you know I'm gonna watch the first couple possessions. Uh, I'm gonna watch watch the attitude. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch the, the 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 toughness meter. You know I'm gonna watch you know those first couple blockouts, those first couple defensive possessions to see you know are 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 are, are they walking in that building with with a mentality to to kill and 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 take a bearcat home with them back to, to orlando you know and and <laughs> yeah. i think specifically re- rebounding um is a big part of ucf success when they win they out rebound the opponent i mean it's a pretty simple formula and i think that they have the length the athleticism and the toughness to uh you know dominate the boards and when you can control the boards you can control the tempo um, whether that be crashing the offensive glass or just simply not giving uh, Cincinnati second chance opportunities, um, you know, when when they get defensive stops. So um, that's a big thing I'm watching. And as always, uh, when you're on the road and it gets loud and um, it's a nationally televised game, can you execute down the stretch? Can you can you run stuff? Can you pound it inside the taco and get some easy buckets um, when you need it? Because you get the feeling that that it's certainly going to be a close game down to the wire. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the rebounding. We were talking about it right before we came on about how. You know, this year, you know, I went back and I looked at uh, the offensive and defensive rebounding percentages from two years ago, which was Taco's last full year because he was hurt last year, of course. But uh, the uh, la- two years ago, they were, you know, at least in the top, I think they were top twenty in offensive rebound percentage. I think top fifty in um, in defensive rebounding percentage, but. Now this year, it, they they re- UCF has kind of struggled on the offense uh, on on the on the rebounding percentage. Do you, what have you seen that you know could be a reason for that, or or, or do you th- and do you think that they might be turning a corner here because they did they did out rebound Memphis in the game that we saw uh, earlier, really turned that one around from the game they played on the road. Yeah, it's it's you know they have like we mentioned they have the talent, the length, the athleticism. So, so it's it's not, I don't think it's anything to do with that. I, I think it's just being you know the the intention of of knowing how important it is, mm-hmm. and I think it's all it's all five guys, and so especially when you play in it, you know you play against people that shoot a lot of threes. So you know long shots usually equal long rebounds. So you you get out rebound and you say, hey, come on, big man, where, where were you on that one? And it's like <laughs> really, it's a lot of it can be the guards. You know, it can be one through five. You know, checking your guy and then and then pursuing the basketball. Um, because a lot of those those rebounds that come down to really 50-50 loose balls where where you're you're scrambling to secure it. So um, I think to lock in and just know how important Coach Dawkins is traditionally since he's been at UCF and throughout his coaching career a, a defense and rebounding guy. And they have more offensive weapons this year than they have in a long time. And so it might be one of those, hey, mentality, let's get back to the basics. 
let's get get back to being the first one to initiate contact on blockouts and then go pursue the basketball. And, um, you know, I, I think you look at some odd games uh, throughout the year. I think the FAU game is one that sticks out. Um, I believe they really, really crushed us on the boards. Yeah. And they really had no business. And so you look at a stat like that, and it really uh, is a loss we'd like to have back. But um, I think at this point in the season, they've, they've learned how important that is. And and, uh, and I'm sure it's been drilled into them by the coaching staff. Taylor Young joining us here uh, on the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. This huge game against Cincinnati coming up. It's Thursday night, uh, 7 p.m. It'll be on ESPN2. And there will be, uh, let's see, that's the first of these final six, two of them against the Bearcats. We've got one more against South Florida, one more against Houston, at Houston, one more at Temple, and uh, this is going to be big. I know the next time we're going to hear you on the air is for that SMU game on the 24th. Is that right? Yeah, a little noon, noon tip, a little brunch tip on Sunday. And so, yeah, man, I can't, I can't imagine a lot of teams in the, in the country have what UCF has in front of them. Um, and, and just a tremendous opportunity and challenge and, and – like you said, we'll learn a lot in the next couple of weeks and, and uh, about this squad for sure. It's going to be fun. Thanks for uh, bringing us along on the ride. Taylor Young, T.Y., real quick, uh, how can fans reach out to you? Yeah, you know, I'm, 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 I'm on Twitter, Taylor B. Young. Um, but, you know, I'm not as active as I probably – I'm not as active as you guys, man. <laughs> I, I, I just I – like, I like to retweet your stuff. So, um, you know. But, yeah, I mean, if, if anybody's interested, always welcome to reach out, um, direct message me or, or hit me up, and, and we can connect. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited that, that, that this time in UCF's basketball history, I just think it's a, a, a huge year and a year that we'll remember. So um, I'm, I'm just I'm having a blast, man. may even have a cocktail watching the game <laughs> Thursday. It's a big one. All right, T.Y., thanks for joining us. We'll catch you again soon, all right? All right, see you guys. All right, thanks again to Ty for joining us. Uh, Taylor B Young on Twitter. I just, I, I'm, I'm, I always feel so much smarter talking to him after this because, you know, he he breaks down the insight for us, Eric, and uh, and and gives us exactly what we really need to know. So, uh, make sure you listen to UCF's next uh, home game as well once they get back from Cincinnati. All right. Let's get out of basketball for a little bit, and let's talk about the Diamonds. Let's talk about baseball and softball, because UCF baseball is underway. We had Greg Lovelady on our podcast previewing the season uh, last week, and uh, UCF baseball is off to a, an expected start. They are 4-0. and They swept Siena in three to start the season, uh, and then they got a uh, blowout win over Stetson at home uh, on Tuesday night. So um, now it, it, there was, to be fair, a little bit of nail biting in the opener. Uh, Three two walk off win for UCF, um, and then five to one and seven to one on Saturday and Sunday. Murph, you were there for all of the festivities. Um, <laughs> I, I I remember I sent out a, a tweet saying, you know, as uh, UCF and uh, Siena were tied late on Friday night and opening night, that uh, this seems like a good t- good time to remind everyone that. UCF is fifty-four and four all time against against I almost said Stetson against Siena. Um, now, now, well, now they're fifty-seven and four, obviously. But uh, what did we learn, if anything, from these first four games? Um, well, uh, we learned that there are some guys that we probably should pay attention to. You know that you know we talked about Griffin Bernardo and Dalton Wingo offensively. Uh, you know, with 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 Coach Lovelady, and uh, you know I've written about him and. And we've talked about them just w- between ourselves, but they really showed up. Certainly against that series against Siena, uh, Griffin, uh, Bernardo, and Wingo combined, they go ten for twenty-two, um, and and look like guys who you know we heard all all preseason that they were gonna, they were going to need to step up in their sophomore seasons. Both of them were kind of scared to fail as freshmen, and they needed to really. Uh, put their big boy pants on, and for, at least for one weekend, they certainly did that. And it looks like they're going to be um, pretty crucial cogs in the middle of that lineup. Secondly, you know, Love Lady said the strength of this team is its bullpen, which is pretty amazing considering that this is a team that just last year had JJ Montgomery and Thad Ward and Bryce Tucker and Eric Keppel uh, and Cree Fenfrock coming out of the pen at different times. Those guys are all gone. They have a lot of new faces in that pen. And then over the first four games, uh, that bullpen has given up, 
I believe, two runs and eight hits in 17 innings. Um, not bad. You know, it's it's not it's not bad. Uh, Jeffrey ha- Jeffrey Hagginson looks good. Kyle Kemp, Zach has Hes- Zach Helsel has gotten a lot of work early. Um, so that bullpen looks pretty good. The starting rotation is we're waiting to see. Grant Sherman, the uh, the the grad transfer from uh, Furman, you know, was was a solid first start on Friday night. I think Trevor Holloway and Jordan Spicer were okay. Certainly room for improvement from both of them there. But there's not much to gauge when you're playing Siena. And even Stetson now, 0-4 uh, after last year's Super Regional team. 0-4 to start this year. There's something wrong there. Uh, and so I don't know if UCF's gotten a really good test so far. And they're But they're going to get one this weekend against Auburn. I'm surprised you didn't, you, you were, you didn't mention Chandler Robertson because he's actually – uh, leading the team in hitting, you know, he's six of thirteen uh, to start out and slugging four sixty two. Um, They're all singles. Yeah, but hey, I mean, it's it, you know, it, what does he do? He gets, nice. What does he do? He gets on base. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, yeah, I mean, I, it, yeah, I think that the the overall sense, like you said, is like you know, well, what did we learn? Well. We didn't really learn much because everybody did basically what they were supposed to do. I mean, you know, you're supposed to win these games at least outright. And we may look back on the Stetson game in particular and be like, well, of course they were supposed to actually do that. But um, as we look at the schedule coming up, and this is the part that I I was particularly interested in. Are, are there any chances that you see with this, uh, with, with these upcoming games, where we are going to learn something, because you obviously you do have Auburn, you know, coming in this weekend, with that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then you have that Wednesday against Florida. So you know, you go from Siena and Stetson to, you know, two SEC powers, and it, it's a pretty dramatic step up this early in the season, is it not? It's pretty good. It's it's a it's, it's going to be a solid measuring stick, and you and you also left out. Uh, Jacksonville, a team that made the tournament last year as well. This is a stretch for UCF, starting with Stetson uh, last night, in which they basically play uh, eight straight games against tournament opponents from last season. Uh, the the Auburn team is is really one of their mark. It's really their marquee non conference weekend, uh, you know, series. You know, Penn State's in there as well. Uh, this is not the Auburn team that had Casey Mize. Uh, going number one overall in the MLB draft net last year, or that made it, I believe, to the regional final, hmm. uh, it, it, or uh, just just uh, in the in the uh, in the tournament. But they're still very good. They're they're somewhere between 18 and 22, depending on what rankings you look at. Um, it's going to be definitely a test. It's 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 not Siena, who I believe now UCF is what 57 and four all time against. 57 and um, four, yeah. Yeah, so all it's, fifty-seven it's, it's, of those wins have been at home. By the way, I should mention. Oh, really? Yes. Never faced Siena on the road. Okay. Um, I think they so did yeah, face no, them I, once in the seventies and lost it, but that's it. Anyway, I think what's more, I think what's interesting is you want to see how guys like Trevor Holloway, who had control issues uh, in his first start, how he pitches. Uh, can Jordan Spicer go a little deeper? Um, you know, and and I think it was kind of cured like when the Setson game. But over the weekend, there was still some a lot of issues with with hitting with runners in scoring position, which was a major issue for this team last year. Anyway, it's way early to be saying like, well, it's a problem again. But for a weekend, since that's all we have to go on, it was a problem again, and we'll have to see uh, if they've if they've straightened some things out in the Stetson game. Well, pre- I I just wanted to pop this uh, pop this out here as well, so that everybody knew it. Preseason coaches poll in the SEC this season. Florida was picked second in the East behind Vandy, who is preseason number one uh, overall. And then Auburn was picked fourth in the West, but they did get one first place vote. LSU is the predicted winner in the West. They got uh, 10 first place votes in the West. Yeah, so keep in mind, I mean, the, the SEC is probably going to be like a 10 bid league in the NCAA. So yeah. I mean, it could be fourth. I mean, yeah. look, I, uh, it's going to be exciting, right, Murph? I mean, this is. I think we'll learn a lot about the depth of this lineup. Remember, we had Coach Lovelady talked about he felt he had more depth offensively with bats to replace Ryan and Thomas. So far, so good. But we're going to find out, I think, for real against Auburn, who's going to have some quality arms. I know they don't have mine, but this is SEC arms we're talking yeah. about. And I think yeah. that's what I'm fascinated to see, Murph, is offensively, uh, how do they handle go against Auburn pitching? 
Uh, sure, absolutely. And guys like Osik and uh, Tyler Osik off to a slow start. Pedro, Pedro Castellano had a two-run double against Stetson, but really nothing else so far. And he was their, really their best hitter in the three weeks leading up to the season. So uh, they have some guys who they expect to be more, more productive who uh, just have not been yet in the early going. But on the flip side, uh, Dalton Wingo and Griffin Bernardo look like they're panning out as sophomores. How about uh, the test that they might see against uh, Tanner Burns of Auburn? Because I think he's preseason uh, starting pitcher, first team All SEC. So, I mean, at least we should get him a good, should get one good look at him at least in this upcoming uh, series against Auburn again Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, six six and one respectively, and then the game at Florida in Gainesville. 6 p.m. on Wednesday, so uh, be aware of that. You can listen to the Florida game, by the way, uh, on uh, uh, on audio on UCFNights.com. All the uh, other games are on UCF Knights TV, so uh, no broadcast games, at least just yet, as for UCF baseball. Let's go over to uh, softball, Eric Lopez, and they um, just finished up their, uh, their big road trip that they had out to the uh, Puerto Vallarta tournament down in... Uh, Puerto Vallarta. Maybe. Yes, out in, out in Mexico. And not a bad showing, actually. UCF splits. They uh, they had wins over Northern Colorado and Sacramento State. Lost to number 5 Washington and number 25 Mississippi State, the two ranked teams that they played. But um, from what you were able to glean from the uh, from the action in that tournament, obviously we saw some of the social media posts that the players had. Beautiful, beautiful setting for... Uh, playing some softball down there at uh, down there on the western coast of Mexico, but um, what did we learn in terms of the softball from this team? Because uh, right now their overall record is four and four um, as they come back home for the nice classic and probably have a few games that they that you probably would want to pencil in. Uh, although they do have Pitt and Penn State coming up, so what are you? What did we learn from that weekend? Uh, their second weekend of play so far. I think we learned, uh, Jeffrey, that uh, UCF's got a, a strong number two pitcher. Uh, that hasn't been the case the last couple of years, as you've seen up close. Oh, yeah. The, the young freshman, Brianna Vasquez, who's really a nice phenom, back-to-back shutouts. I know it's George Mason and Northern Colorado where she got the shutout. She was honored on the all-tournament team up in Mexico. But, you know, UCF has struggled to get consistent pitching behind Aaliyah White in the last, during, in the last two years. And I think they've got one with Vasquez. And the thing that I jumps out at me, 18 strikeouts and 18 innings pitched so far this year for Vasquez. Hit, swing, and miss. Uh, I think that is something that is huge. I think she's a great compliment to Aaliyah, who's more about contact, doesn't strike as many out. Uh, Vasquez is a kid that uh, her personal pitching coach was Tony Paisley, that for all the other longtime softball fans, was a former three-time CUSA Pitcher of the Year at East Carolina, was a thorn in UCF side beat them for the 2010 conference usa championship uh i think she's legit and and that's the thing that's exciting plus you got this other freshman alicia tomberlin who i think is going to find her way into the lineup who can hit so uh, i like some of the new faces and it's not surprising you know this was a class that i know that the even the previous staff liked uh coming in i think the new staff likes as well uh and, and adding some depth that they haven't had the last couple of years i think it's still a work in progress team i think they're still uh, adjusting to a new philosophy offensively, so it's kind of been hit and miss. But um, you know, it's it, it's about what I thought for and for. I think they would have liked to have played better. They kind of played a, 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 at a higher level, but again, it's early, and I don't you know teams don't peak this early. So I think they're working out to their kinks, and uh, it's so early in the year. It was a tough start to the schedule when you considered you're playing Ole Miss, you're playing Minnesota, you're playing Ohio State playing Washington, you're playing Mississippi State. That's five NCAA tournament teams right there. And they got a win against Ohio State. So uh, now they'll be home for a little bit. And uh, I think it's about the growth of this team and, and the growth of the belief and in, 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 into what they're doing and try to get better each day. I know it's cliche, but I think when you have a coaching transition, that's a part of it. Are you concerned about the offense at all? Because I'm looking at the season stats right now. So yeah, J- T- uh, Tamisha Glover – is uh, leading the team right now. She's 10 of 21. She's a 476 average. Jasmine Aspar is the second on the team at, uh, among qualifiers, at least at 308. Uh, and then it goes down to 263, 235, 222. And you know, I, and I know that uh, that that Coach Bear would had you know coached the number one hitting team in all of college softball last year at Boise State. 
Uh, is it growing pains that we're seeing in the adjustment to a new hitting philosophy, or is it just the fact that the competition they play has just been really good? That you know that UCF right now is hitting 257 as a team while opponents are hitting 294. I think it's yes. The answer is yes. I think <laughs> Both. Both. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I do. I, you know. I think. Yes, they face great pitching. I mean, first of all, Washington, you know, they threw Terran Navallo, who's one of the National Player of the Year candidates against UCF. Uh, Minnesota threw Pfizer, who's a Big Ten Pitcher of the Year uh, candidate. Ole Miss threw their ace as well. Uh, so I, I think it's part of it is they've seen some great pitching. The other part is, yes, I think there is an adjustment with Coach Bear's offensive philosophy uh, and the players. So it reminds me a little bit, Jeff, of when Scott Frost got here. Remember that when we talked? How many episodes did we do about how this offense is just – you know, they, it's just, it's not, you know, there's kind of some growing yeah. pains. It they weren't, you know, they didn't seem like, like they were totally in sync. Right. You know, and some, you know, they're still trying to figure it out. And eventually they did, uh, maybe the next year, but I don't think it'll be that, taking that long. But my point is, yeah, I think there's a bit of an, an adjustment. You're still learning this new philosophy. You're still trying to buy into it. Um, and it's early. Uh, so, yes, I think, am I concerned? No, I, I'm not as concerned yet because I know hitters like Cassidy Brewer can hit. I know other players in that that haven't hit can hit. So it's early. I think we – and Murph knows this. With baseball, it's the same thing, right? We always over-exaggerate early starts, right? Only in baseball and softball do we freak out if somebody goes two for 25, even though that player might go two for 25 in, like, middle of the year, but nobody notices. But because it's early in the year, we notice it. Um, so while, yes, I think there are – you know, you, you, I understand the concern. I do point out, yes, they face top pitching, and I think they're still learning the new style of offense here and the approach and it takes time and it takes time and uh it takes reps and we'll and it you know you can only practice that so often in practice and things like that it went you know when you get live action that's when it really counts and we'll see how they do this weekend when they're at home now for a tournament against Pitt and the Penn States and Coastal Carolina and, and moving forward from there and try to grow what do we know last question on softball what do we know about the teams coming into town um this weekend because you got Coastal Carolina on Friday and and Pitt. Chanticleers. Yeah, the Chanticleers. And uh and Pitt on Friday. Then Saturday you've got Penn State and Pitt again, followed by Sunday Louisiana uh, you got Sunday Louisiana Tech and then they play La Tech again on Wednesday. So what do we know about these teams coming in? Well I think Pittsburgh obviously is the ACC team. This was a team that was literally the first the last team out of the NCAA tournament last year. They have a new coach as well uh, and Coach Hermanick coming over from Ohio. Uh, so they're in a bit of a transition. So it's obviously an ACC game. The good news, I can promise you this, boys, uh, you will not see any pit players faking injuries at, in the softball diamond, unlike <laughs> the football front we saw in the fall, allegedly. Um, How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> I said allegedly. Yeah, right. um, it's just a coincidence. They just kept falling down after big plays. I mean, hey. Cr- lot, lot, lot a lot of weight being placed on that, alleged, on that allegedly, right, Murph? <laughs> oh, yes. It's the heaviest uh, word in the language. <laughs> yeah, ask- yeah, I know. Uh, but, yeah, Pittsburgh's obviously pretty good. Penn State's a Big Ten team. So, that's a, you know, UCF beat them last year in Jacksonville. They're kind of trying to give, build a way. The best team, arguably, in this field is Louisiana Tech, who might be the favorites to win Conference USA. Uh, they're ranked 25th, actually, on the fastpitchnews.com poll. Chief plug. Um, so, yeah, I think they're really good. And I think that'll be a challenge for UCF, more, especially playing them uh, Sunday and then Wednesday. So, I, I think it's a good RPI games. And I think it's an opportunity for them and, and to grow. And I'm fascinated to see uh, Aaliyah and, and Brianna kind of continue their one-two there and kind of mix and match there a little bit from that staff. Because uh, I think they'll split the work. And then we'll see how the offense here coming back home being comfortable how they look and uh, see if they put Mexico behind them. Because they always worry about, you know, Mexico, long trip out of the country, now you're back. I always worry about teams that come, had a lengthy road trip and come back with, like, any rust or, you know, are they are they kind of flat right off the first home game. So I think, yeah. but I think they'll be all right. I think they'll be ready to go. All right. So we'll be keeping an eye on that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Five games for UCF softball coming up. Uh, a few news and notes to pass along as we uh, finish up here. Let's give it up for the UCF women's golf team. They uh, won the Moon Golf Invitational two-day event held over in Melbourne. Uh, UCF came out on top by nine strokes as a team, 15 under par uh, as a composite, uh, taking out uh, behind them six ranked teams, including Louisville, Oklahoma, Campbell, Old Dominion, Augusta, who, of course, Augusta University is really good at golf, 
Um, and uh, Kennesaw State in that field out in Melbourne. So uh, congratulations to uh, UCF on that one. Uh, on the player leaderboard, uh, the individual winner was Lauren Hartledge of, uh, of Louisville. Highest ranking night was uh, Chinatsu Kobayashi, who finished tied for third uh, with a six under par in that tournament. So congrats to the Knights. They get the victory uh, over in uh, Melbourne. Uh, men's golf, uh, they finished in seventh at the Gator Invitational uh, up in uh, up in Gainesville. Uh, their next tournament will be at the beginning of March at the Southern Highlands uh, Collegiate. Interesting that they call it the Southern Highlands Collegiate. It's being held at, in Las Vegas, Nevada, of all places. Uh, I know there's Highlands in Nevada, but, you know, it's not really all that Southern. Anyway, um, men's tennis. Uh, at one and five currently, but later this week they uh, head out to Alabama. They play at Sanford and at Alabama, Birmingham after a two-week break since their last match at Michigan. They're not back home until Tuesday, February 26th, when they play Bethune Cookman, uh, actually twice at the uh, at the U.S. Collegiate uh, at, at the USTA National Campus, I should say. Women's tennis. Uh, to update you on them. They're, by the way, college match day is coming up, but uh, they uh, took care of uh, took care of Ole Miss on Sunday and Alabama uh, in Tuscaloosa. So two wins over SEC teams, uh, and they're ranked number twenty one in the country right now. So uh, six to one in both, and so they come back home Thursday, February twenty first. Um, we're recording this on Wednesday, February 20th. So that's uh, down at home. They play an old foe, guys. Georgia State, going back to the old A Sundays. Uh, and then Saturday, they've got a ranked opponent coming in. That's the University of Denver. Uh, 5 p.m. for Georgia State on Thursday. 11 a.m. Saturday for Denver before college match day, which is Sunday, where they play the Florida Gators. And that will be on the Tennis Channel. Eric Lopez, I know how you have that wow. unlocked pretty much all the time. No, I mean... It's insane, by the way. Have anybody realized how insane this weekend is of UCF Athletics? Like, it's insane. You know who knows about Auburn. all about that? The video staff and the communication staff. They know exactly how insane this weekend is. <laughs> you've got you got Auburn at UCF Baseball going on. Three-game series, Friday night, 6 o'clock, Saturday, 6 o'clock, Sunday, 1 o'clock. you got men's basketball on Sunday at noon at home against SMU. Women's hoops is at home on Saturday, Jeff. Are you doing PA there? Are you sitting yep. outside? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that's Saturday. You got softball hosting a tournament all weekend long, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then you got tennis at Lake Nona, including a huge, highly profiled match against Florida on the Tennis Channel. Tennis Channel, by the way, they have now their own uh, – they're doing shows from Lake Nona, from that place now, uh, X amount of times during the year. They just signed a new deal with that, uh, that place there at the USTA. They're going to be doing shows from there. Uh, and carrying a lot of events from the USDA Center, including College Match Day. Uh, but this is insane. It's an incredible uh, weekend of UCF sporting events on campus, which does not even include the Apollos, who's going to ruin our, our, you know, freaking parking situation, Murph. Now, you know, we got to deal with that on Saturday night. But it's insane. And I don't even know if it's an equi- equinox. It's more than but, an equinox. But wait, there's more. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, UCF Track and Field is in Birmingham oh. for the American Athletic Conference Indoor Championships, by the way. Um, any uh, qualifiers move on to the NCAAs, which are Friday and Saturday, March 8th and 9th. But we should be keeping an eye on that. Right around the corner, first outdoor meets uh, at UCF are coming up pretty soon. Uh, Black and Gold Invitational, Friday and Saturday, March 15th. Uh, and 16th coming up, and then there's the UCF Invitational uh, one week after that. So uh, a couple of home dates for the uh, or, or for UCF uh, track and field coming up. They always host about like two or three uh, two or three matches a year, uh, or two or three meets a year at home, and those are always fun to get to because it's like a mini Olympics. I think if you ever get the chance to go down and check it out, it's pretty cool stuff. So. And uh, there's your UCF sports calendar for at least this upcoming year. You know, you ever see? You guys ever seen like the full sports calendar on UCFnights.com? Like this this coming weekend, like that one week, this weekend coming up is like insanely long. Like there's <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff going on that they have plugged into this thing. It's crazy. So uh, lots to keep track of. We will have plenty to catch up catch you up on on our show next uh, week. So let's talk about what we've got coming up uh, coming up next year. 
uh, on Black and Gold Banneret. Uh, Murph, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you have coming up? Well, I know I'm going to hate Sunday with a passion. <laughs> I, I just know that just straight off the bat. And just only because I'm going to have to find a way to uh, write a good basketball story and then hopefully finish it in time where the baseball game isn't over yet. Head over to baseball and then talk to Greg Lovelady as if I've been in attendance for the full three hours of that game. <laughs> um, because I have a story to write on that series right after that. Um, you should go so up to him and be like, "Hey, coach, like, can you can you fill me in on like what happened?" So, yeah, be like, yeah. So, so what, coach? Um, quickly, what happened? Does that be my question? Uh, we talked about resumes and like, would you rather have this really hard schedule down the stretch or a bunch of like cupcake teams down the stretch? So I just want to like, if there's a, another good comparison that I wanted to quickly point out, it's with Temple who, you know, depending on what brackets you look at, they're right there in the bubble as well, uh, right there behind UCF in the conference. They have five games left, and they have one quad one game left. That would be at Memphis. Otherwise, though, home to Tulsa, home to Tulane, yo, and <laughs> at UConn, at UConn, and then home to UCF. So, at you know, Tulsa home game is a quad four and then you have one quad one, quad one game against Memphis. The rest are decent quad two games. For UCF, though, six games left. Uh, I, I believe that five, I believe like five of them, four or five are quad one games, and then the SMU game is a quad, I believe a quad three. Uh, you would much rather be UCF in this situation. Both teams are on the bubble, but UCF really has a chance to play itself in with quality wins, whereas really uh, Temple just has a bunch of can't lose opportunities but they probably those win those wins if they get them probably don't carry enough weight uh, to where they you know they probably need to win two games in the tournament in the conference tournament to really bypass some teams on the bubble because their late season schedule just isn't hefty enough so the moral of the story is is every game is this a must win game must win no i don't know but the moral of the story is you might have ucf schedule down the stretch because it allows you to play yourself in to the tournament if ucf goes four and two over these next six and that includes a win against smu because you can't lose that game if they go four and two over these last six and then win one game in the tournament i I can't see a way unless there's a, a a a, a cavalcade of bubble teams that just that just run winning streaks and a bunch of uh, teams that steal bids elsewhere. Uh, four and two win a game in the conference tournament. They're probably in the tournament in the NCAA tournament. Eh, no pressure. Eric, what do you got? <laughs> wow. Well, um, I got to figure out what the heck I am doing this weekend. I'm supposed to. <laughs> I want to go check out Auburn UCF. Uh. Saturday is tricky because I got you got softball going on and baseball and women's basketball all within a very similar race. Sunday, I agree with Murph. You got men's hoops at noon, softball at two thirty, baseballs at one. I don't know how I'm going to be able to be at all three. Meanwhile, I got to hope I keep beating down Murph on our pick to click baseball game. There were oh, personally man. playing in because I'm fired, Jeffrey. I am beating. I am beating up. Wait, the wait, 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 wait. Guru. What is this pick to click? Right. We've got, we're gambling now. This is very, uh, this is very this is, legal. This is what we do now. How did I, how did I miss got, the boat on this? We've got bounties on players' heads. Oh, great. We're like Greg. No, we're, we, like Greg <laughs> we're like we're, we're like Greg Williams. If Greg Williams is betting on college baseball. Oh, man. <laughs> it's a little exaggerated, but that might be All right, all right. It's oh, a little God. exaggerated. Get, get me at We got to get out of here real quick before no, we get no, into we're, some we're, real we're, trouble. We, we, just pick, we each pick a baseball hitter that we think will do well in that game. And so far, my guys have done better than his when I've picked. I've been very fortunate. So. Okay. Yeah, but like, like, yeah, but Elo picks Ray Alejo, and Alejo all of a sudden turns into Babe Ruth. <laughs> it made no right, sense. Baby. It made no nice sense. Thing. Keep it up, yeah, Alejo. I will try, <laughs> but uh, so I'll try to. I will try to be at all those things at some point this weekend. Plus, on the banneret, I actually have written uh, some TV numbers. Are people watching UCF basketball? I have the answer for you. I have numbers. <laughs> oh <laughs> wow! Talking about a tease. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I got numbers for men's and women's hoops, so uh, up there as well. So that'll be up on the banner. All right, we'll take a look at that. I've got a, I, I've got a little look at UCF's tournament chances myself, uh, using Bracket yeah, Matrix, bro. which is my new favorite site in the whole wide world. 
Uh, don't pay attention to what Murphy what, to what Murphy just, says because I'm just going to hit the panic button like outright. Like every game is a must win situation. One, one note on bra- on bracket matrix. Yes, to find aggregate site. Those 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 rankings, the, the brackets. Yeah, they 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 rank them like bracket matrix actually ranks the quality of each uh, prognosticator. This is why. So, yes. <laughs> yes. Right. No. What I'm saying is though, if you see some really. If you see some really favorable ones, I believe it's Delphi uh, for for and for men's basketball. It's uh, D E L P H I. Uh, Warren Nolan's very good. There's a there's one that's called Pulse, uh, which is a kid I think his name is Pulsifer. Um, he does he does one. He's yeah. supposed to be very accurate. They do like three year averages on these things, but it just goes to show like make sure you know which which bracket like the quality of the bracket that you're looking at because I've seen UCF being seeded by like a nine seed or an eight seed. Yeah, don't know, and that, unfortunately, that inflates their their average on the site. So they, so they, it, it, you know, it, it boosts yeah, but them. Yeah, doesn't that even out with some people that have them out completely? So I kind of, you know. Right, exactly. But make sure you know when you look at these things the actual quality of the bracket. Yes, don't this take is that word for gospel. Those so a lot of those brackets, us. a lot of those brackets are just straight trash. Right, right. This yeah. is this is why I like it so much is because it does weight them based on who the most accurate bracket is. By the way, uh, Eric, your boy uh, Lenardi, you want to know what ranking he is out of the what is it, one hundred and twenty seven uh, brackets yeah. that they have? Well, this is good. Is this so? Are we going to use this to pick and pick who will be our guest bracketologist to bring on in a few weeks when we break this down? I mean, uh, this I, is yeah, do. why not? I would do it. Sure. All right. All right. All right. But, but, all right. Give me the breakdown. Okay. The breakdown, so, yeah. so we'll we just talk to you like who like the top five were. Your boy, your boy, Lenardi, you want to know where he ranks out of the 127 different racket brackets? Go ahead. 68th. Yeah. But he's on Mark. Marketing is outstanding, though. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Brad Evans of Yahoo, 33rd. So that and gives you. The- yeah. And he's the brightest mind in fantasy football. Yeah, I know. There you go. Uh, Stuart Mandel by the, <laughs> Stuart Mandel from the Athletic, a guy who we know, a guy who uh, we're very familiar with. He's 16th. He's actually pretty good. That's not too bad overall. So yeah. uh, I'm going to be run right to reach out to. Yeah, I'm going to be I'm going to be linking to all this stuff. And yeah, and yes, our guy Warren Nolan is fourth, which is really impressive. Um, Warren's good, man. Yeah, yeah. Is Warren knows. I don't know. I got to find that out. Jerry Pond. I believe. I believe, and I, and just so you, just so, and just so we can pull that up, I believe Warren has either UCF on the twelve line or out as yeah. of right now. And by the way, like <laughs> Jerry Jerry Palm of CBS, eighty uh, second. So, ugh. Yeah, all right, good. Tell Brodsky that because I've been arguing with Brodsky about it. He was trying to defend Palm, and I'm like, Palm has no idea. Yeah. Get out of here. I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to send. I'll send this. Uh, I'll send this to Brodsky. But anyway, um, so that that'll give you an idea of what we're looking at, at least as of uh, right now. All right, let's finish this thing up, guys. Thanks once again. Uh, be sure you to follow us at blackandgoldbanneret.com. You can follow us each on Twitter. I am at Jeff underscore Sharon. Brian is at Spokes underscore Murphy. Eric is at Eric Lopez Elo. Uh, and you can follow us all collectively at. UCF underscore banner on Twitter. Don't forget to follow all of our other guys as well. Jeremy Brenner, uh, Luke Saris, and Luke Saris SBN. Uh, so much going on. We got, I, I've been following our uh, our guy, Zach Goodall, who's got some really good NFL draft stuff that he's been looking at of late. Make sure you follow him. Um, it's just a, an embarrassment of riches with us here at uh, Black and Gold Banneret. We're also at Facebook.com slash Black and Gold Banneret. And subscribe to this podcast on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and tune in. For Eric Lopez and Brian Murphy, I'm Jeff Sharon saying thank you so much for listening. This has been the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical.